Mental amps and nerfs. What are they? How do they function? Are they good writing or just a writer cop-out? These are questions that have been asked by anime fans around the world across countless series, but it's probably most prevalent in the anime Naruto. So today, we'll be answering those questions and more, analyzing mental amps and nerfs in a way that has never been done before. In other words, today we'll be exploring and breaking down Naruto mental amps and nerfs explained. <laughs> Before we jump into it, it's worth noting that this is part 3 of a series that I'm calling Naruto University, where I go over the things in Naruto that I think need to be more deeply explained than they have in the past. If you haven't seen the other two videos, make sure you go check those out after this, and if you have anything you'd like for me to go over like this, feel free to drop a request in the comments. But for this video, I think that in order to properly cover mental amps and nerfs, we first need to establish a solid definition for each of them. So first, we'll cover mental amps. As a general definition, mental amp can be defined as a state in which a character becomes temporarily stronger due to the circumstances they find themselves in, usually caused by a change in their mental state generated from the emergence of powerful emotions. In the Naruto world, this can actually be easily explained by simply examining how chakra inherently works. In the Land of Waves arc, we're introduced to the fact that chakra is created by combining physical and mental energies. Training your body can increase your physical energies, which contributes to higher chakra and training your mind can do the same in regards to mental energies. So, it logically follows that a sharp spike in a character's emotions, or mental state, can lead to a sharp spike in their chakra, as your experiences and thus emotions would be directly tied to your mental energy. A good example of this is when Naruto summons 2,000 clones against Gaara in Chapter 133. Prior to this, Naruto is too fatigued to summon anything more than a tiny toad, and is shown panting from said fatigue multiple times. And despite Despite desperately wanting to save his friends and thinking about it multiple times, he cannot muster up the strength necessary to take down Gara. However, upon realizing that he is the only thing standing between his friends and certain death, Naruto remembers back to when Haku told him where true strength comes from, in protecting those precious to you. He also remembers what Kakashi said about protecting his comrades. Naruto's look then visually changes, he builds up an enormous amount of chakra like he never has before, and manages to summon two thousand clones. Now, this is widely acknowledged as a case of a mental amp, but why exactly is that? Well, the reasons for this are pretty clear in my opinion. Number one, we have a very clear indication of it being a mental amp via the flashback to Haku and clear change in emotional state due to powerful emotions. Number two, Naruto barely manages to pull off something far less impressive right before this in only summoning a few clones and not even being able to summon anything more than a tiny baby toad. And and number three, the feat Naruto accomplishes here goes far beyond anything that we've seen from him thus far in the series. I also went through several other examples of widely accepted cases of mental amps, and this type of criteria actually fits all of them, so based off of what we see, we actually do have a good framework to work from in terms of establishing whether or not a particular feat in question is the product of a mental amp. I believe in order to establish that something is likely to be the product of a mental amp, we need to establish at least two of the prior components. Number one, we have to get a clear indication of the character in question changing their emotional state, most often due to powerful emotions. And number two, we need to be able to establish that the feats in question go beyond what that character's normal ceiling is. Without these two things, we can speculate, but we cannot say for certain or with any level of likelihood that something is in fact the result of a mental amp. So let's go over another good example, Naruto blitzing the Raikage. This one has been high hotly debated, but I think it's immensely clear that this is, in fact, the product of a mental amp. First, let's cover the scene. So, Naruto is obviously attempting to get past the Raikage in order to get to the Fourth War battlefield, but A is not allowing him to pass. They show relativity multiple times, with A actually seeming to get the upper hand on a few occasions, despite A being in V1 and not V2. But then, after B demonstrates a mental amped feat himself, which I'll go over quickly in a second, Naruto echoes what B says about having another source of power outside of their bijou. B points to the words that A told him long ago, 
spurring him on and helping him to find strength when he needs it most, referring to those words as a sun or a source of light or power. And Naruto says he has two sons, Minato and Kushina. He goes over how he got to meet his parents and the mentalscape, and how their words and what they've entrusted him with in the power of the Nine Tails and the title of savior push him to new strengths as well. Then, immediately after this, A powers up into what B calls his full power, charges at Naruto, and Naruto is able to successfully dodge the attack. A then tells Naruto that he not only dodged his fastest punch, but that he was also attacking with intent to kill. This means that Naruto went from being below a holding back V1A to above a full power bloodlusted V2A in a matter of moments, with the only indication of change coming from him thinking about Kushina and Minato's words and their legacy they left behind for him. This is about as clear of a case of a mental lamp as you can possibly get. It's also worth noting that right after unlocking Kurama Chakra Mode, Naruto uses Body Flicker in order to attack Kisame within Samehada, but he gets his foot stuck in the wall because he's just stated to not be skillful with it, but then we get a stark contrast of that here. Not only is his Body Flicker now fast enough to blitz past a full power bloodlusted V2A, he's also able to seamlessly control it. So in this, we have both the indication of a change in mental state driven by powerful emotions, as well as a demonstration of power and skill that goes beyond what he was able to do previously. Therefore, this is likely the case of a mental amp. Quickly, before we move on to resolve amps and why they're different than mental amps, let's take a brief look at B winning the Lariat Clash versus A. We have good reason to believe that this is also the result of a mental amp for a few reasons. Number one, B straight up calls back to the words A told him as a child and says that those words give him strength. Number two, we see A shrug off not one, but two Lariat attempts prior to this. Number three, less than three days prior to this with no indication of B training in that time span, B requires the V1 Bijou Cloak to match A's V1 Lightning Cloak, and 4, Data Book 4 states that A has the greatest physical combat ability in the Cloud Village. This data book covers up to chapter 691, which is around 150 chapters after this event occurs. And yet, B is able to, in base, overpower V2A's Lariat with his own Lariat. So not only do we get an indication of change in mental state due to powerful emotions, we also get numerous pieces of evidence to showcase to us that this feat he performs is far beyond what he can normally pull off. Therefore, it is the product of a mental amp. But now that we've covered mental amps, what they are, how they function, and a few examples detailing the criteria for judging whether or not something is the product of one, it's time to briefly cover resolve amps. Before we do that though, if you're enjoying the video so far or maybe have learned something, feel free to like and subscribe. You know, unless you enjoy wearing wet socks. If that's you, Please, for God's sake, leave immediately and seek psychiatric help. So, resolve amps are weird, and they're often confused with mental amps, but they are very different. The primary way that they're different is that they're not really amps at all, at least in the sense that they're not taking the character beyond their usual maximum, but rather allowing them to reach their maximum when they're operating below it. Think of it as entering flow state, or like when Ash Ketchum flips his hat around backwards. The character in question isn't actually demonstrating a feat that goes beyond their normal capability, they're just more so locking in. Like mental amps though, they are often brought on through powerful emotions, typically somebody is operating below their normal capability because they're mental nerfed by negative emotions that are nerfing them, which I'll get into later, and then something happens that sort of snaps them out of it. A great example of this is in chapter 608, adequately titled Kakashi's Resolve, where Kakashi, while massively fatigued, goes from being absolutely throttled by Obito to, after regaining his resolve, being able to straight up blitz him. So, as demonstrated by A, Kakashi sulking and being visibly shaken up over the revelation that the masked man is Obito, B, Guy outright telling Kakashi to pull it together, and C, Kakashi thinking back guiltily to Rin's death, we can clearly see that Kakashi is massively mental nerfed whilst being juggled by Obito. Then, after Naruto reminds him of the lessons he taught Naruto about never letting his comrades die, Kakashi acknowledges that his resolve had wavered, locks back in, and proceeds to blitz Obito with the Raikiri. 
since this type of feat is replicated later on, and we get to see several indications of him being physically relative to, if not slightly above this version of Obito throughout the rest of this encounter, this is consistent with what Kakashi should be able to do at his peak. So while identifying a mental amp requires that we get a clear indication of both powerful emotions altering someone's mental state, as well as a demonstration of power or skill that goes beyond what a character can normally pull off, identifying a resolve amp requires number one, evidence for them initially being in a state that's below their standard strength, number two, evidence for an emotional state change driven by powerful emotions, and number three, a demonstration of strength that showcases them going beyond their prior nerf state, but not necessarily beyond what they could normally pull off. Another great example of this comes from Hiruzen versus Orochimaru. We get clear indications that Hiruzen is mentally nerfed from having to fight his beloved student, and we then see him getting fodderized by Orochimaru and the Edos, and then finally, after being reminded of his duties as Hokage and Orochimaru Sensei, we see a change in his emotional state that returns him to what he should normally be capable of pulling off, allowing for him to take down the Edo Hokage and outmaneuver Orochimaru despite being fatigued. We have other examples of this, such as in the data books, Jirai being stated to harden his resolve against pain, which is what allowed him to land the kick on the animal path that he did. We have Oniki regaining the will of stone, Tsunade regaining the will of fire. Like I said, numerous examples, but I think you guys get it at this point. Resolve amps and mental amps are inherently different, although easy to mistake for one another if we don't know the full context of the scene in question and the character in question's full capabilities. But now that we've covered those, it's time to finally move on to mental nerfs. <laughs> These are a bit easier to cover since we've already sort of went over two examples of them. In both the Kakashi and Hiruzen Resolve Amp examples, they were mental nerfed prior to hardening their resolve, as a Resolve Amp is essentially just locking in and overcoming some sort of mental nerf. But what exactly is a mental nerf? It's just the polar opposite of a mental amp, as you probably could have guessed. I think a fair definition for mental nerf would be a state in which a character becomes temporarily weaker due to the circumstances they find themselves in, usually caused by a change in their mental state generated from the emergence of powerful emotions. The identifiers of this state are also the inverse of what they are for mental amps. Number one, we need to get a clear indication of the character in question changing in emotional state, preferably due to powerful emotions. And number two, we need to be able to establish that the feats in question are below what they'd normally be capable of. Although the two examples mentioned prior are good demonstrations of this, sometimes it can be tricky to identify a mental nerf if you don't know what to look for, so I'll go over one of the most famous, or infamous, mental nerfs in the Naruto series, Minato's lackluster performance versus Jubito. Let's start with this. Why do we know that this performance is a product of Minato being mentally nerfed? First, there's a direct statement in Data Book 4 that indicates that Minato was in a stupor during this encounter with Jubito. A stupor is defined by Merriam-Webster as a condition of greatly dulled or completely suspended sense or sensibility. So if someone is in a stupor, their sense and sensibility is greatly dulled. The second definition given by Merriam-Webster is a state of extreme apathy or torpor resulting often from stress or shock. Both of these definitions match the conditions we get for Minato here, especially when put together, since the most reasonable cause for this stupor is what's going on with Obito here, which I think would be shocking to Minato. Which leads me to my next point. We have other evidence that Minato is in a mentally nerved state because we directly directly get to see a change in his mental state due to the emergence of powerful emotions. In this moment, Minato just discovered that his student, who shared the same dream Minato had and was potentially like a son to him, didn't actually die and instead became the world's most infamous terrorist who not only is currently at war with the shinobi world, but also was the conduit for the Nine Tails attack, leaving the blood of Minato and more importantly Minato's wife Kushina on his student's hands. Not only that, but this student that he dearly loved and probably grieved the death of after feeling like he got to Kanabi Bridge too late and failed him, is now taking on the task of becoming the Ten Tails Chinchuriki in order to eliminate the Shinobi Alliance, but in the process is mentally crumbling before Minato. 
Kishimoto is very intentional with the paneling here, showcasing the pain that Obito is in, even drawing him shedding tears and highlighting Minato's emotional observation of this event. So the dialogue that takes place after Minato realizes who Obito is, along with what's showcased in the moments leading up to the key event everyone talks about, clearly demonstrates that Minato is probably mentally nerfed here. But arguably, and most importantly, we do get to establish that the feats he displays here are below what he's normally capable of pulling off, particularly in terms of reaction speed. After the dramatic moment I just covered, we then see Minato somewhat steal his resolve and attempt to take down Obito, only for Obito to stabilize before Minato's eyes, saying, finally, master. Immediately after this, we get to see a shocked expression on Minato's face, followed by Obito cutting his arm off and tossing a truth seeker orb at him before Minato can fully react to what's going on. Since we've established that a stupor can be the result of shock, it's reasonable to assume that the stupor is maintained or even heightened upon the shock of Obito stabilizing and cutting Minato's arm off. But how do we know that this anti-feat is below what he's normally capable of pulling off? Later on in the war, a much weaker version of Minato without half of Kuruma's chakra is capable of using FTG to react to 8th gate guy plus levels of speed. This feat comes from the battle with Jubi Madara, and while this is hotly debated, it should not be. First of all, we know that 8th Gate Guy is definitively faster than Jubito. We know this because Jubito is below Jubidara, and Jubidara is below 8th Gate Guy's Sekizo speed, which is what's being referenced here. Guy is able to blitz all the way around Jubidara before he can recognize that he had gone behind him and fire a blast that tags him before Madara can effectively move to block. This is with the second step of the 5 step Sekizo, with each step increasing in both speed and power. This this means that the fifth step must be faster than the second, and the fifth step is what Minato reacts to with FTG. Or more accurately, what Minato reacts to is a kunai thrown from Lee, which outspeeds Guy's fifth step Sekizo. Since Lee throws the kunai a greater distance than Guy travels in the same amount of time, it verifiably outspeeds him, and Minato reacts to that speed with FTG, teleporting to the kunai, catching it in his mouth, and then teleporting away before Guy can cover a few meters. Some people try to discredit this feat by saying things like, well, Guy was in the air, so it can't be his full speed, or, well, Guy changed direction on the fifth step, which should make him slower because he halted his momentum. However, these don't make any sense, because, number one, Sekizo is stated and shown to be an attack that takes place in the air, so him being in the air wouldn't make it slower, and number two, Guy changing direction could just be how he normally uses the technique, as we don't get any indication that he's changing direction due to outside forces, and also any loss in momentum could be countered by the increase in speed granted by the higher step. So that being said, if Minato can verifiably react to speeds greater than 8th gate guy's 5th step Sekizo, why would he not be able to react to and teleport away from Jubito's attack? The answer is clear he's mentally nerfed. As you can see, sometimes it takes a little bit of extra digging to discern whether or not someone is mental nerfed or amped, but you can always lean on the criteria given prior to determine whether or not an amp or a nerf is taking place in a given scene. But that does it for this video. I hope you all enjoyed, and I really hope everyone comes away from this with a better understanding of Naruto as a whole, but specifically mental amps and nerfs in the Naruto series. Next week, we'll be taking a break from this Naruto University series, and I'll be joining by my buddy Six to go over Sasuke versus Itachi form by form. I hope you guys are as excited as I am, but before we go, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone who watched all the way to the end. I greatly appreciate it, and I love you. Uh, make sure that you guys like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss out when new content drops, but until next time, have an awesome day.